Um, so the main part here is that you're feeling very encouraged. So this is obviously a sign of the mind getting still. And it doesn't matter if it dissolves quickly. That's natural in the beginning when the limiters come up. You know, they can come up just in a flash or it can feel like somebody's just turned the light on in the room and then, you know, it's gone again. And I think it's just the mind, you know, preparing for this. Like the mind isn't quite yet um, confident with it. So it gets a bit excited and there can be like a rush of PT and a reaction of kind of wow. And then, of course, the Nimitta disappears. But this is just par for the course. I wouldn't worry about that. I would more take it as a sign that things are happening and it says here that you're feeling encouraged. So that shows that things are becoming alive for you. Things are actually um, happening to give you confidence and encouragement on the path. So I don't know if Ajahn wants to say more about um, yeah, limiters. I, I will be. Being the, what do you call yourself? Nimitter taster. <laughs> yeah, whatever, no, taster. I don't. <laughs> but I do know that those limiters, when they come with very bright lights, a single light, a single shape, they are the best. Eventually those limiters are meant to become something which is simple and very profound, very bright. The light limiters are always going to be the best to use. And next time it comes up, after a while, you learn just how to just leave them alone. And they last. And they go, you know, first of all, just go very quickly. And then they last a bit longer. And then they last a bit longer. And they last a bit longer. And then you just learn how to um, stay with them. Look, uh, one of the examples. I was you know, getting some nice limiters on a retreat you know, many years ago. And then they would always go very quickly. I couldn't find out how to make them more stable. And at this particular time, I remember trying to figure out what the problem was. And I was uh, shaving my, my chin because monks have to shave. And as I was shaving, I just got the insight that if I held the mirror totally still, then the image in the mirror still kept on moving. And I realized holding the mirror still didn't help. It was you know, the one who was looking. I had to hold my face still. And then the image in the mirror became still. And that was like a nice little way which I uh, transferred from shaving in the mirror to watching the limiter. Nimit was like a reflection of my mind. And it was only moving because my mind was moving. So once I kept the mind still, I wasn't trying to keep the limiter still. I was trying to keep the one watching still. And then the limiter became very still. And the other thing with the limiter, it just gets more and more a rich colour. And I don't know if you've noticed this yet, but the colour you see, if it stays there a bit longer, you find it's not an ordinary white. It's a more white than any white you've ever seen in, you know, with your eyes. If it's a yellow, it's more yellow than any yellow you've ever seen. And the point is not to get excited or afraid. Or another hindrance, which I don't think, I've never known any other man get this hindrance, only myself, when I was meditating in the cave. And this nimit arrived, a beautiful nimit, it was a yellow light but it had a shape to it and it was like a yellow you could never see in the real world but the shape i noticed the shape i could recognize the shape was of garfield the cat and as soon as i recognized this was a garfield limiter <laughs> i just burst out laughing and that was the end of that meditation very stupid but you can do that the reason was i was Watching, no, not on the TV or anything, but on, on newspapers, the Garfield cartoons. And I was looking too many of them. And so when I got a nibble to it, looked like Garfield. <laughs> but I don't mind sharing those stories. I'm the only one I've ever known had a Garfield nimiter. I would admit it. Yeah, admit it. Yeah. <laughs> it, certainly, it certainly was a nimiter because my mind was really peaceful. And the yellows were something just incredibly more yellow than yellow. Anyway, we all have stupid things. But eventually they get more and more powerful later on. So it's great you start again the powerful limiters coming up. Okay. Uh, you want to read it? Yeah. 
Okay, thank you for teaching. Oh my goodness. Thank you for teaching this inspiring retreat. Luckily, it's virtual as otherwise Ajahn Brahm's presence would have left me for too starstruck, starstruck to manage any questions. And a big thank you to Venerable Chanda for infusing the whole retreat so generously with Metta. It is spreading down all the way to Las Palmas to Gran Canaria, which is gracias. Oh. I do remember this, uh, one of the, the disciples from Perth, this woman, she she was um, wanted to see His Holiness the Dalai Lama, made an appointment, went up to Damsara, had to wait a couple of days and before she could have an audience with His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And apparently in Damsara, not Damsara, that's another monastery, Damsara yes. in, in India, that they have a place you meditate every morning. So she was meditating and she got there early sitting down and then someone sat next to her and she made the big mistake of having a look to see who it was. And this was quite a few years ago. And she turned around and she saw it was... Richard Gere. Richard Gere. And she <laughs> a film star, very handsome at that time. And she said, okay, just let it go, let it go. Richard Gere, I'll do next to Richard Gere. <laughs> she was so Star Trek, that was the end of her meditation. Yeah. But just to say that actually you might not be so starstruck because when I first met Ajahn Brahm, I was trembling pretty much with awe because I already felt you were my teacher, Ajahn, from yeah. even from Myanmar. And, yeah. you know, I left my teacher in Burma to pursue Ajahn Brahm, <laughs> not knowing who he was or anything, yeah. but just having a lot of said that, like listening to all the early Reigns talks and... Um, and uh, and you quickly got me out of that by playing around, joking around, and making me laugh. And <laughs> yeah, I'm also bad. so I'm not as um, well. No, it's nothing to do. I'm with not that. as handsome as Richard Gere. No, it's definitely nothing to do with that. But the point being that I think a good teacher puts you at ease, you know. And this is yeah. something that I think uh, Joan really has the knack with, and that's just out of meta, so that you do feel able to ask your questions. Because if you can't, then how can you learn? So I think it's a very skillful way of behaving. <laughs> okay, I'll uh, read this, shall I? Yeah. Thank you for the possibility to do this wonderful retreat. I like to meditate on my bed, some bed, full stop. Sometimes I doubt if it's a good idea because of the different energies. What is your advice? Thanks to be here and have the possibility of this wonderful retreat. Sadu, sadu, sadu. So if you like to do that, then yeah. I don't see that it's a problem. If it's making you happy, that probably means you're enjoying your meditation. It's encouraging you to meditate, maybe even as soon as you get up. So I think it's fine. I mean, if you find that you're always going to sleep because you're on your bed and you're sort of lazy and I don't know, slouching and it's hurting your body in some way, then maybe it's not a good idea. But I think, you know, there's nothing wrong with meditating on your bed. Presumably you have a Indeed. pillow or something. It was also the case that Ananda, the oh, Buddhist sure. chief disciple, he was meditating all night, or not getting anywhere, and he decided to go and take a nap. <laughs> and he got enlightened just as his head hit the pillow. So we call that the Ananda method of enlightenment, going for a nap. So you can get enlightened on the, on the bed. So, no worries at all. Mm. Go for it. Excellent. Do you want to read this? One? Okay, dear Ajahn and Venerable Chanda, some. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh, Chanda, I, when I close my eyes to meditate and when I'm ready to go to. Oh, deep. sorry. Ready to go deep, I can feel my two eyes are not relaxed in the, in the same way. My left eye feels a bit heavy. Feels like there is an energy imbalance and this distracts my focus. I then spoke caring to the body and it started to get better. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Could this be a result of tired eyes or something else? I think I have tired eyes. Thank you uh, so much for the pack. Good advice. Yes, give it kindness and those eyes will balance. Maybe if you had a third eye, imagine the difficulty that would have. You have three eyes to balance. Okay. Yeah, I often think it's better not to worry too much about the cause of these things, but more to look at like how the way that you speak to them or relate to them softens it all up. So sometimes it's kind of, we don't really know why. But um, I find, especially if I look at a computer a lot, then my eyes get really tired. Yeah. It takes a while. 
Okay. Does everyone have to get light limiters to indicate advancing on the path? No, be careful. Don't try to advance on the path. Try to disappear on the path. Light limiters are the easiest ones, but you can do the whole path without the light limiters. Mm. That's good to hear. And also, um, it's not necessarily a sign that someone's more progressed than someone else. And I always like to emphasize this because the path is the eightfold path. Mm. And someone might somehow skim through the others very kind of superficially and somehow get into these light limiters, maybe through force, maybe through a bit of good luck or even past lives. But if their virtue is not holding up in daily life or if they have a wrong view, this is going to make a huge obstacle. Either the limiters stop arising if the virtue is no good or it doesn't have the benefit right, for oneself or others. And then if there's wrong view, you could get a long way. You could even get into jhanas, but it's unlikely to take you any further. And that's probably why some of the mystics in other traditions, they get stuck at that point, even if they do experience what we Buddhists might call jhanas, it's there's no incentive to go further because their goal is union with God. So they usually won't progress beyond that. And the can, like Ajahn said, you know, become a lot of ego and that as well. You know, this is my real self. This is my true self, cosmic consciousness and the rest. And I have seen a lot of sort of spiritual materialism with people trying to guess which jhana other people have and kind of comparing their experiences. And it's almost like drug addicts talking about the drugs they've taken. I find it quite distasteful. <laughs> I've seen that. <laughs> and um, I mean, this is not obviously good practice and it's not the majority of people, but um, all the same, don't think about that too much. It's more the result of letting go than some kind of um, thing you have to attain. Shall I read that? Yeah, okay. When parts of my body disappear during meditation, I feel lightness and joy. Today, however, when my hands disappeared, soon after it felt like some heavy object was placed in their place. And the more into meditation I was, the heavier it became. I ended up finishing my meditation earlier as the heaviness was really uncomfortable and I wanted to feel my hands again. I'm curious what happened or what it was, as it was the very first time I experienced something like that, and I'm not sure what to do if it was to happen again. So to me, that's just a different parts of perception playing around. Um, it doesn't really matter if it's lightness and joy or heaviness. It's just perception experiencing things slightly differently. And for me anyway, the way I understand the practice is that everything that arises is a chance to make peace. So I don't think there's something wrong just because you tend to react to that with a feeling of dislike. It's actually more of an opportunity to learn to um, make peace with something that initially seems unpleasant, whether or not it goes away, right? Because we don't make peace in order that it goes away. That's just doing a deal. But I, I think if you can, and if it's not too uncomfortable, I would be more curious about that and just to stay with it and see what happens. But it's okay to stop if you really are uncomfortable. And um, also not to expect it to happen again, because if you start thinking, you know, I'm going to sit down, maybe it's going to happen and get nervous about that, then it may be that you even sort of create it and get a little bit stuck at that place. So, you know, there's so many experiences we can have in meditation, so many different ways to perceive the body, so many different, if you like, elements to experience, because this is just kind of earth, right? It's just heaviness. It's one of the natural phenomena that exists. So I wouldn't worry about that at all. I think it's good that you are having these different perceptions. And, uh, you know, the perception is, as Ajahn Brown sometimes says, taking wings. I am visually oriented, and the simile of the two shopping bags, past and future, works well for me. I can put the past down, but halfway through the meditation, I pick up the future again, and the mind runs off. Thank you for your guidance and wisdom. I hope to meet you both in person one day. Yes, so if that happened before in your meditation, the next time you do that, you put the past and the future down. Just keep a little bit more awareness on your right arm, the imaginary <laughs> right arm, and just when it starts to go down to the future, stop it. You know, when it starts to go down, catch it early. If you catch it early, then you can stop it early. But once you've got your hand in that bag, 
of all the future fantasies and dreams and hopes and despairs and consciousness or what else is in that bag. Once your hand is in there, then you're done. It's caught you. <laughs> so tell yourself that hand, keep out of the future. And it's wonderful to be peaceful and have no past and future. Mm -hmm. uh, what you can also do with the future is in that bag deliberately put in a couple of um, mouse traps. <clears throat> so if you put your hand in that, <laughs> you get caught by the mouse trap. <laughs> Only imagine it once. <laughs> Could she also program mindfulness? Yes, yeah, certainly. Yes. So something that happens repeatedly, if you start to see that something's a habit, it's good to like remind yourself at the beginning. Okay, mind, you know, you have this habit, you have this tendency to pick up the future. So for this meditation, and say it when you've got a bit of mindfulness. Say for this meditation, I will not. I will not go into the future. I will not go into the future. Or you could put it in a positive way, like I will remain content in the present. And you program yourself like that and then forget about it. And if it keeps happening, don't worry. You have to put in a new program and the new program takes some time to get enough strength to overcome the old one. But it will, it will stop. This is your feel for me, okay. I think it's for you. Ajahn. Now, Ajahn once in a talk likened the five aggregates to Chanel number five, at which point I nearly fell off my chair. <laughs> But since then, I never forgot the five aggregates, five hindrances, or anything in fives for that matter. So I'd like to just say thank you, Ajahn Brahma and Venerable Chanda, for an amazing retreat, explaining the Dharma in such a meaningful way with valuable meditation gardens full of metta. Also, oh. thank you to the organizers, Derek Matthias. It's Anya. It's Annie. Oh, Annie. It's Annie, my bookings volunteer. Okay. The one who's invisible. No, it's not this Annie. This okay. Annie is the cook. Annie is, anyway, I have to yeah. speak up for Annie because she's the kind of person that just oh, plays okay. very quietly in the background. And she's my number one help in the sense that we organize everything together. So without her, these retreats just yeah. wouldn't happen. Like we're on it together yeah. and we work full time, basically. So Annie needs a big credit. And I'm okay. really happy that Samantha's mentioned her. Thank you, okay, Samantha, because she's brilliant. She okay. serves with such humility okay. and such anonymity. And she's just there for for everybody whenever they yeah. write in okay so, yeah and the rest of the Annie Camper team Annie Camper. <laughs> oh thank it's, you for expressing yeah, your okay. gratitude it makes us all very happy and I'm sure I will pass it on to Annie yeah, okay good yeah <laughs> if plant light is an emerging form of consciousness does this mean that some mind streams must spend more eons on some side than others yeah of course that's one of the reasons why the, in the Tibetan traditions, they make this resolution as a Bodhisattva resolution, that I am going to um, uh, forego my own enlightenment until the last blades of grass <laughs> are fully enlightened. So out of compassion for all those who think like that, please don't plant lawns in your garden. You don't want to put off their enlightenment any longer than it has to be. <laughs> Sorry, I've just been singing tonight. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, you're up to time. Oh, yeah. Um, Ayad Chanda, today's guided meditation on the qualities of peace and Nibbana was a rousing success with me. Yay! It brought up great energy and happiness in me at the beginning. This was a little rough and uncontrolled at first, but gradually slowly calmed down. Pauses in your guidance were helpful here too and in the end I was with more peace calmness and fading very effective I plan to try this again with the recording excellent and much appreciated wonderful and I'm really glad you mentioned it because at the beginning I wanted to um attribute my influence there and inspiration to a couple of people one of whom is Ajahn Brown who sometimes <laughs> just says the words peace it's like just I don't know when you've done that but sometimes I think you give a little meditation and you just say the word peace and pause and I've asked him to do that for me sometimes when I'm a bit agitated in a retreat and I just say can you just say the word peace and I just listen you know in between that word because when you say it I mean yeah. you feel it Oh, yeah. I mean, Ajahn feels it to the point his eyes start getting teary and then you can't speak anymore exactly. after about 
I don't know, two minutes. Yeah. And it's just so inspiring. I don't do it now. Otherwise, I won't be able to run. Don't do it now. And um, it's true. And, <laughs> uh, and there's another monk called Banti Sajiva, who um, I was inspired by on that because he he also goes through that little verse by the Buddha. Um, and it's the Buddha's words, you know, when you hear the Buddha's words, especially when you're meditating, I think it's really, it goes to the heart. So I'm glad that helped you. And um, yeah, it's a little verse that's there in the suttas. So you can go through that yourself and find your own meaning for these words, because it's on, you know, this is the beauty of the teachings, right? That these words will resonate in different ways for us at different times. So you can find your own uh, way to practice with that. And the recording is also going to be available. Okay. Dear Ajahn Brahm Venerable Chandra, so the death of an arahat brings his her mind process with the six senses to an end. Scary, really scary. I don't <laughs> know why you say it's scary. Human beings are scary and animals could be scary, but arahats, they're the least scary being in the whole world. They'll never harm you, but you're thinking about yourself. If you were an arahat and you disappeared, what do you want to continue on for? Don't you realize that all our hearts would realize that life is suffering? Mm. And they know the four noble truths. And so I know some years ago, I always like to try and find some similes. I say like the human life is like some of these comets you see in the sky. They're going round and round and round and round, you know, the our solar system. They've been going around, circling around in orbit for thousands, millions of years. And then, after going around and around and around so many uncountable times, then they meet like the atmosphere of planet Earth. And this is going to be the end of all of their circling around samsara. But then before they go out, they made this beautiful light in the sky. And sometimes when the big um, comets or meteors, whatever you call them, hit that atmosphere, it's a beautiful light. And afterwards, they disappear forever. So our hearts, that's like an our heart. Yeah, they disappear forever. They go out with a beautiful, wonderful light. And then their job has been done. Somewhere, I heard that Nibbana is to stay beyond the six senses. If it was, then it's not cessation. The Buddha never said that, a state beyond the six senses. If it was beyond the six senses, especially beyond the mind, beyond the knowing, beyond the consciousness, it would be an unconscious state. If it was an unconscious state, it would be the same as not existing. That brings me to the question whether there are more than six senses at all. Anyway, I'm very grateful for all the inspiration, new tools, new ideas, new translations, of course, <laughs> all the bad jokes. You said all the jokes, actually. Yeah, I'll put the bad in there. I'm honest. I don't, <laughs> did I say the first, the first day of the retreat about how many letters in the English alphabet? Probably. Did it? No. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. You've got a good memory, much better. Than I'm me. not sure you did though, because I think it was at a talk. Okay. But if you didn't hear it, it was obviously forgettable. <laughs> <laughs> so how many letters in the English alphabet? Oh no. I can only remember 25. I've forgotten why. <laughs> uh... Yeah, a couple of people <laughs> Okay. All right, here we go. Dear Ajahn and Venchanda, oh, can I say one more thing about the last question? Yeah, yeah, sure. that, um, oh, this lovely uh, sentence in the Ratana Sutta that says, Nibbana Garmin Paramam Hitaya. It means the Buddha goes to Nibbana for the ultimate benefit of all beings. Yeah. So, I mean, imagine if the Buddha hadn't done that, we wouldn't be here, would we? Yeah. There wouldn't have been something to remember that was something so extraordinary and so inspiring that it could you know continue for so many thousands of years and even eons so it's really incredible that when this happens as Ajahn says I mean first of all the service this person's capable of giving is immense and incomparable and then it lasts for so long 
And after a while, it may feel scary at first, but when you understand that these senses are ceasing with that remainder, it's not scary at all. It's like you're out of prison. It's like the disease has been finished. It's a wonderful feeling of freedom. Mm, and the thing is, you can experience it in incremental stages. Yeah. So you know when your practice is deepening that you feel better, you feel more peaceful, and that's because more has disappeared. So it's just the process, and it just gets better and better. Okay. okay. Ah, dear Arjun and Venchanda, thank you so much for your loving guidance. You inspire me a lot, and I'm very happy to be here. After the last guided and very beautiful meditation, the question came up, when all the five components of existence, including consciousness, have ceased, there is no one left to experience nibbana. So we only experience the joy of peace as long as there is a residue, a body remaining. Yes, but the joy of peace actually is not that real. Yeah, actually it's more peaceful than it was before, but you know, it's going to change, it's going to water, and it can't be kept because the senses, that's how the senses are. All those six senses, if things remain the same, they disappear, they have to. So, you know, even just once a person is an arahat, what do they experience? What's it like to be fully enlightened? And I mentioned that this morning, uh, this, yeah, this, uh, this afternoon, how an arahat experiences being an arahat is just suffering arising, suffering persisting, and suffering passing away. You look at their faces and they feel just so joyful and happy. But it's a lesser suffering than anybody else feels. And also the joy that they're soon to get out of jail. Mm. Imagine, isn't it, the less suffering because there's not a sense of I. I'm Indeed, suffering. yeah. Indeed. It's just suffering. And then if there's no resistance to that, there's no issue with that. Yeah. Must be. Very and you don't try and sort of change it. This is just how it feels. Mm. Mm. It's not scary because. Fear, as I think I mentioned in one of those talks, fear is uh, you imagine you're losing something, a possession, an attachment. If an hour hard, there's nothing left to lose. You don't have anything. You're possessionless. That's why there's never any fear. During my practice, I got to notice how my beliefs determine perceptions. Oh. If I believe in rebirth, I can find ev evidence for it everywhere. But this is also true for the opposite. I can now spot many such inconsistencies, and somehow I lost trust in my own thoughts, feelings, and perceptions, and those of other people. Everything seems constructed by my mind, and I don't know what is real anymore. Any advice? Yeah, I think this is great. It might feel a bit scary. You might feel a little bit lost at the moment, but actually it can be so freeing in the sense that we become far less judgmental of ourselves or anybody else. And I think in that gap, it's that gap, isn't it, where you don't know what's real anymore. Something else can come in, which is the virtue and the compassion and the ability to respond to others with metta and loving kindness because you don't know what's real. So, But you do know suffering's there, right? You know that suffering's there. You don't really know why or you don't, you know, maybe make so many stories about it or get lost in all those um, kind of misconstruing of things or fabricating of things. You don't have to add all that on. You just can feel much more. So I think when we start to move away from like trust in our thoughts, we actually can go deeper into the feeling part of the mind and into the intuition, intuitive part of the mind as well. And this is where the virtue is really important, you know, so that you know basically what is harmful and what is not so it doesn't matter if you know what's right or wrong in a moralistic kind of way but you know what's harmful and what's unharm not harmful and the human mind you know if you're a good person you're going to follow what's on not going to harm so this is i think very true and um you know you say that you can believe in rebirth and find evidence and you can also find evidence for the opposite the best thing there is to just keep it as an open question 
question. Don't fall down on any side, but keep exploring. So I think also this don't know mind is a mind of investigation and it can start a really genuine investigation into truth. So I think this is very good. And just keep the virtue as your compass whenever you feel a little bit uncertain. And where the five hindrances are gone, mm. and again, there's so much more certainty there. You're not acting from beliefs. You're acting from direct experience, which is pure. Mm. And I guess when the five hindrances are gone, which they will become yeah. increasingly, there's no fear either, because yeah. that's one of the hindrances related to yes. aversion. Thank you so much for this great retreat. My practice has really deepened and have experienced a lot of peace. Great. We had peace today for lunch. Mushy peace. Oh. You were dying to say that. <laughs> However, I'm struggling with overwhelm and some fear with all the letting go at the moment. I feel I need movement and solidity. I much, may just be exhausted. Any suggestions? You never push the practice of meditation. Sometimes, I mentioned this at the very beginning, ask your body, ask your mind, body, what do you want right now? Mind, what do you want right now? I work with your body and with your mind. Be a friend to it. You may think, I've got to push my body, I've got to push my mind. Don't do that. Otherwise, your body and mind will rebel. Sometimes you get sick when it rebels. So, uh, ask your body and mind and what it says, follow. Mm. And it has been a lot of talk about letting go. I mean, this hasn't been like a lightweight retreat in a way. Yes, there's been meta and there's been joking, and you know. But it's also been quite intense in some ways, you know, going into the, these noble truths and talking a lot about letting go. So, yeah, I mean, it can be a lot all at once. And it's the time after retreat that you have to integrate these things so you know just to really relax and go slowly especially when you exit so-called exit you know especially when these teachings end and you're back in your daily life you know just to really um let the teaching sink in over time don't try to retain anything okay do you want to read that shall we read it i'll read it out for you Today I've experienced probably the weirdest and also one of the most joyful meditations in my life. Somewhere in the middle of my meditation, when everything was deeply calm and relaxed, I found tiny tension, which was still in my body and needed to be taken care of. I started practicing recollection of the Buddha. Shortly after, I realized there's nothing which needs to be done and tremendous relief arose. Then I allowed my body not to be calm, not to be grounded, not to be still. Very good. The joy which arose at that moment encouraged me to let that meditation be silly, goofy and childish. I started swinging my poor little tired mind on a tree swing. <laughs> I found I was literally rocking my head gently but energetically and laughing so loud that the sound of laughter was spreading over the mountain like soothing and a joyful echo. Thank you all for this fruitful time. So, hey. sound, sound. <laughs> so nice and creative and yeah. fun and yeah. playful. <laughs> I always remember from uh, one thing I just Chito says that I really yeah. like. He says, Your meditation is much too important to take seriously. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> Which is great. So, it's nice to bring a bit of light relief. <laughs> Anything else you want to say? No, no, that's great. Keep going? Yeah. Thank you so much for this retreat. During these days, I am starting to see how I had blocked feelings away. I am the feeling type and also had a very difficult year. Huh? And how I subtly order my thoughts on peace or love. I am miles away from hearing celestial chanting or seeing bright lights, but to me this is huge. Pain is slowly vanishing and I feel peace after so long. I'm immensely grateful and wanted to thank you for your teachings, meditations and online support. Oh. That's excellent. Well done. And I actually think feeling that much peace, you know, after a long time is much more of a reliable measure of the um, benefits you gain than if you'd just seen like a, a light once or heard some chanting I mean that's only you know these are just little signposts but it's actually the peace that you're left with that's the really important thing like how much is suffering disease 
deceased or ceased. Yeah. Yeah. That's brilliant. Yeah. And you never know how far away or when you might experience these things. But honestly, they're just quick experiences. I mean, obviously, if it's the real Nimitta, it's something big. But you never know what might happen. Okay. Did you want one or No, I'll read it. Okay. In present open awareness, we notice what's appearing in our minds. Today, you also said we should be inquisitive. My mind gravitates towards dreaminess, so awareness takes effort and easily fails. Do you have any tips to help me stay aware? Well, firstly, I say notice when you are aware. So rather than saying you're failing when you're not aware, take every moment of awareness as a sign of progress. Because if you weren't meditating, you wouldn't be very aware most of the time anyway. So in a way, when we start to practice, we simply see how unaware we are. And any awareness that you have is already like an improvement. It's a big uh, change, right? Because especially if you're the dreamy type, um, yes, it might take a bit of effort. But yeah, it's all the better, actually, if it takes more effort in the sense that, you know, you have to really make that intention to be aware. So you have a great opportunity to develop your strength. Any tips to help me stay aware? I don't know. I can't think, actually. You want to say? Yeah, no, just the awareness grows quite naturally. One of the tips to be more aware is don't take the mind energy away from awareness. If you like watching TVs or watching football or going into arguments with people, that will actually take away your mental energy and you'll find the awareness gets more and more dull. You know, don't take intoxicants or drugs which uh, take away the awareness. Then after a while, when you live a simple, peaceful life, the awareness grows quite naturally. Yeah, the other thing that can happen, actually, is with the dreaminess, if it's a kind of um, dulling out, or a kind of like the mind's just floating a bit, is that um, sometimes it's helpful not to fight it, but just to stay with it and let it be that way and wait. And eventually, like if you stay still, then the mindfulness starts coming back. But for that, you might have to wait a while. But if you can go through that dreaminess, you might find, you know, if you stay still and if you stay present as much as you can, that the mindfulness starts coming back on its own. Okay. Is it necessary to study the sutras to progress on the path? I think I'm too old to remember. I understand it very well. Thank you. No, you don't need to take on too many sutras. As long as you've got some good teachers who can get to the heart of the suttas and explain them to you. Uh, because there's so many suttas. I'm very happy that I sort of learned them when I was young. But quite, quite honestly, these days I probably wouldn't have put that effort in. Because again, you try to study them, but you can't remember them afterwards. So no, you don't need to. Yeah. And remember the Buddha, I mean, gave one sutta yeah. sometimes to one person, right? And then they went away and meditated just with a little pithy saying from the Buddha. So it's not as though they were all written out and all the monks were like, you know, hearing every single sutta. Yeah. So some people do say you have to like be a scholar, but that to me yeah. seems totally uh, nonsensical. I think you just need enough to give you the motivation to practice and enough to keep you on track in line with the right view. So, yeah, I always feel grateful to my teachers for being the Pali scholars. I don't have to do it. So. <laughs> <laughs> so still more. Yeah, Ajahn, this morning you mentioned the story of the Ajahn mosquitoes that help not to waste any time in the beginning of your meditation and go straight to the deepest states so the body and the biting would simply vanish. Yeah. There is a good word in German for this pressure that an impending suffering can cause. It is called Leidenstruck. I probably pronounced that terribly. Do you think that such a pressure of a looming great suffering helps to get into deeper meditative states? Actually, it sometimes does. It can also make you too tense to get into deep meditative states, but often it can help. Mm. A bit like artists sometimes producing their best work during or after some personal tragedy. Yes, indeed, because sometimes I know that my mind can be lazy. You don't, if you won't, if you don't have to. But when you know there's mosquitoes and you can almost hear them in the distance and say, okay, no laziness, 
let's meditate properly. So yeah, I agree with you there. Yeah. Yeah, and the artists who do their best work after some tragedy, it's often because they're, you know, they can't control their emotions at that point, so they just pour it out. It's like a kind of letting go. I would also yeah, say I that see. the monks over in Bodhinyana Monastery, they know from long experience that when I'm really tired, <laughs> when I come back from doing some busy work outside of monastery, that if I give a talk, I usually give the very best, deepest talks while I'm exhausted. And so sometimes I tell them, please, I don't want to go out to do this, so you do it. They say, no, you do, because you're giving a talk tonight. Mm -hmm. I think it's really unfair that they exhaust me on purpose <laughs> so they can get a good talk. Weird, but it's true. Okay. As you know, when you go on retreat, anything can pop up. On this retreat, on the very first evening, as soon as I saw both of you, I had a deep feeling of being a very bad little boy and feeling very self-conscious. <laughs> <laughs> During the whole retreat, I've worked through this with Meta and managed to let it be and see it's not mine or me. Wonderful. I've learned to just get out of the way and it's both silent and more peaceful. Thanks, Meta. Thank That's you. so nice. Yeah, I mean, this is the thing. Sometimes, you know, we have these certain conditionings inside us that are there. And for some reason or another, people trigger that. And I guess if we both look like authority figures, even though we're not really like that at all, um, then it can bring these things up. And that's all good practice if you're able to work with it and not project it outward. So it sounds like you really work with that well. And um, with the meta, which that little boy needs. Beautiful. Dear Jan, you mentioned yesterday about non-monkish thoughts, old girlfriends and stuff. Just let them in and they will disappear. This is what you mean when you talk about opening the door of your heart. When you open the door of your heart with kindness, you're not trying to get rid of these old things. You are treating them as just, you know, they're happening, they're coming in. Be kind to them. And then you're actually undermining them. They can't do anything to you anymore. And so they vanish. When they're a problem, then they take front and center of your mind. When they're just you know, old thoughts, they're just like the clouds in the sky. They just pass by by themselves. Can you do the next one? You can, yeah. If you wish. It's you. Okay. Dear Ajahn, you're an Ajahn. Yeah, I'll do the next one. Okay. <laughs> Dear Ajahn, please clarify that the sound of silence meaning the quietness. Or anything else. Or anything else. Now, I know that sometimes in some Hindu traditions they use the sound of silence as a meditation object. But I remember that, I think it was Ajahn Menindo told me this, he was walking with Mahasi Sayadaw, and I was asking him about the sound of silence, and the Mahasi Sayadaw replied that when the mind is still, it doesn't hear any sound at all. Hmm. So basically the sound of silence is not really an object that's taught by the Buddha. And yeah, um, yeah I think when you talk about silence, you don't. you don't. You're talking about silence without a sound. Yes, indeed. Okay. Okay. Dear Ajahn Brahma Venchanda, thank you for the retreat. I feel so privileged to be part of it. And Venchanda, the guided meditation this afternoon was wonderful. I must confess that I find some of the Buddhist teachings at times quite dry and some of the fundamentals don't sit well with me. I used to get a bit frustrated, but over the years I've learned to let go and trust the process because also some of the teachings don't make sense to me. What matters is the result. Yay! That's really true. Through the practice of meditation and your teachings, my attitude towards life has changed. And as a consequence, I'm a lot more content, more fulfilled and face life's challenges with curiosity and a much more open heart. Wow. <laughs> and I'm even more successful in business. So thank you for all your teachings. Question for Arjun Brown. Can you repeat what was the yoga asana you practiced to cure your sciatica? I don't understand which one, as the audio was not very clear. Oh, that was the cobra. Mm. That was when you lay down on your front and you push up your, you know, your shoulders with your arms. And so you're bending your back in a position which was very, um, I suppose, nice for me to experience. But it also, it just you know, repositioned 
uh, those vertebrae in the correct place. So that's what I use, the cold proposition. Mm. I like snakes, they're very kind. And I just want to say in response to this question that I think you're very wise because, you know, you're, you're keeping an open mind to these teachings that you know what kind of feels like something you want to give more attention to, something you don't want to give too much attention to, but you're not actually throwing it away and you're looking at the result. Like, where are these things actually pointing? And that's the whole point of the teachings. The point of the teachings isn't to say what a nice teaching or what a poetic verse or not a poetic verse. It's to change you and it's to relieve suffering. So this is very wonderful. And I appreciate your honesty as well and also your support. Because you're very supportive to our project. <laughs> okay is the quote below that we study today to be understood in a certain context the noble eightfold path is the best of all practices this is the only path for purifying insight there is no other i assume there are people who are enlightened that never came across the eightfold path but i don't know of course please expand a little bit Should i say something yeah, so I think the point of uh, mentioning this particular reference today was to point out that it's not either samatha or vipassana, it's not satipatthana, it's not any one limb of the path that is the most important. It's the noble eightfold path, and that encompasses the whole of the Buddha's teaching, basically. It encompasses sila, the virtue, it encompasses samadhi, stillness, and wisdom. So it can be further divided into these three. So that's the, the point of saying that, because some people do say, and there's been a wrong translation at the beginning of the Satipatthana to say that this is the only path. But what it really means is this is the path leading in one direction only, which means that if you practice Satipatthana, and of course that implies that it's empowered by the previous path factors, the other six, if you practice it properly without the hindrances, et cetera, and with right view, with right intention, and ultimately with samadhi, and then it will lead to liberation. It won't lead in any other direction. And this is the liberation that the Buddha's talking about, which is why for any kind of enlightened person, they have to have somehow practiced all those eight factors. And I think the one that's missing in most uh, other traditions is right view, because many other practices teach mindfulness, even teach samadhi. But if it isn't empowered by right view, then it will be misinterpreted somewhere along the way or it's likely to be i mean it's not to say that there are no other enlightened beings the buddha did say that there can be enlightened beings in any tradition wherever you find people practicing the eightfold path so this is kind of what he discovered as the the essence and the part of practice that can't be you can't take away from that you need all those eight factors otherwise it's it's a defective path Anything else on that? No, that's great. Great answer. Dear Ajahn Venerable, could you please explain the meaning of Sati Sampajanya? How to incorporate it into daily life with lots of metta and gratitude? Ajahn Chah would not use the phrase Sati Sampajanya, would use a shortened version, Sati Panya. It means exactly the same. Samp Sampajanya means with wisdom using the longer form of panya, which was pajanya. Sometimes that these words, you know, even in uh, the, uh, the suttas, sometimes it's older versions of the word and sometimes newer versions of the word. And obviously that we actually shorten words. And that's what language does. And so this is where sati sambhajana means mindfulness with wisdom. Mindfulness by itself is not good enough. And I think I mentioned already about the lady who came to Anukampa and she told her housekeeper or the guard at the gate, please make sure that no uh, robbers come into the house. And of course, when she came back, I've told us already, so I'm shortening the anecdote, that when she came back from Anukampa, the house had been ransacked. I thought you were being mindful. I was mindful, madam. I saw burglars going in, and I noted burglar going in, burglar going in, burglar going in. I saw jewelry coming out. I noted jewelry coming out, jewelry coming out. That's sati, mindfulness, without wisdom. If you're the guard, then the wisdom will tell you to, if you see that burglars coming in, call the police. That's sati and panya. Mm -hmm. 
and also in daily life just to um maybe add the bit that i find really helpful is to look at um the sorry i'm trying to find the question the sampajanya i mean there's many aspects to sampajanya but one that's really helpful for me anyway is looking at the context and the right thing to do according to the context that i'm in because sati is not you know enough i mean you can be mindful of doing all kinds of things but is it appropriate to the context is it actually the most wise and compassionate thing to do given the conditions so there's no like one uh way of applying sati fits all it has to be adaptive and it has to use your wisdom so look at the purpose of what you're doing the motivation behind what you're doing the context and um and that will help a lot and also remembering to be mindful because you know it's all very well to talk about mindfulness but if you forget to be mindful then you have to first remember that that's what you're meant to do so uh you want to do this oh yeah dear Angela, i was reflecting on my conditioning it seems i have to unlearn most things my family and society programmed me with this path is undeniable to me the same is tiring to go against the stream all the time did you feel like this early on I suppose in one way yes because I had to uh, I had to find my own path many times people told me look you've got a good education why are you wasting it by going off to time and becoming a monk they didn't understand what I was doing but the point was that I understood what I was doing and I just could not refuse that path. And it's the same with you. It's You don't have to unlearn most things. You learn more things. And you can understand how other people see this world. And then you understand how you see this world. It doesn't have to be an argument. Uh, even when I was a lay Buddhist, I did things like, you know, just giving up alcohol. And at the end of my university career, I asked my friends, what do you think of me being a Buddhist? And they said, it was like you're giving up alcohol. We didn't understand why you did that. You never told us to give up alcohol. You just you still came to the parties. And, you know, you were very welcome at the parties because you were the one person who could drive everyone else home afterwards. Mm. So whatever it was, you don't argue with other people who see things differently. You're kind. You may suggest a few things, but after a while, that you are programming your friends, not the other way around. And that means that it's much easier after a while. You go against the stream and then you change the stream. In order to do that, I also suggest having other people going against the stream with you because when you're alone, it is hard. And this is what I find now in the Western country as a Buddhist nun, the only bhikkhuni actually in the country, it's very hard to go against the stream alone, you know, and to stand out and to be like in the public eye and to have all kinds of projections and expectations of others and so many other things. And for people that haven't ordained not to realize the difficulties, you know, it's impossible. I mean, it's nobody's fault. You just can't unless you're actually in somebody else's shoes. And this is a very, very different decision to take than the one that most people take in this life. So I would say as well as going against, uh, not going against your family, but, you know, being an influence on the people that you're around, trying to spend time with people going in the same direction as you as much as you can. And without wanting to promote this place, and I don't know where you live, but go to monasteries if you can. Go to be with other people that get it. And then that part of the conversation and that part of yourself, you don't have to explain. It's now too late for me to become a monastic. I'm 65. I first decided I would become a nun when I was 10, but teenage years changed my mind. I married and had children. I often wondered about the, wonder about the next life and I don't want to return. It would be great if I could be born in a country where Buddhism is the norm and I could dedicate my life to the Dhamma. I guess there's nothing I can do in this life to help a good rebirth. Thank you both for this incredible retreat. Well, I think this incredible retreat might help. <laughs> so this is what you can do. You can practice. You can keep practicing in the conditions you have and make best use of them in whatever way you can. And, um, you know, getting this feeling to dedicate your life to the Dharma now, even though in the past, you know, you may have gone slightly, just become more involved in an ordinary worldly life. The fact that you still have this very strong inclination to me suggests that you will get a good rebirth. And if you keep practicing, who knows? 
you know, you may get enlightened in this life. Don't give up. Okay. Dear Ajahn, how a sense of self can be reduced? Please advise. Thank you, and Venal Chandler, for your kindness, joy, and wisdom. And again, it's the same old answer. One of the ways a sense of self can be reduced is by letting go enough to go into these deep meditations. And then you realize just how this sense of self is a huge burden. It is not very helpful. And you can often when you come out of the deep meditation, then you realize, well, what on earth did I carry a sense of self for? You can do much better in life without that sort of sense of self. You can laugh more. People can't sort of criticize you very much because you know who the heck are they criticizing? <laughs> if they call me stupid, who are they call me stupid? Is it my body is stupid? My form, my experience is stupid, or my perceptions are stupid, or my will is stupid, or my consciousness is a stupid. Won't you actually see things not as a self but as a process? You have so many more advantages. And you know, even just after they did the Bikuni ordination, I had a lot of criticism, but it was, it was actually like water off a duck's back. I wasn't a duck, but nevertheless, it felt like that because there was nothing there to hold any sort of people's criticism. Yeah. Can I just add a couple of little things you can actually do in terms of practice? And I think reading the suttas is really helpful, like reading what we've been doing here again and again. You know, like remembering that basically we're comprised of these six senses and there's five khandas, there's no, it's a process. You know, just brainwashing yourself in this way. And then also sometimes I start my meditation by sitting down and I look at what's in there and what I'm taking to be a sense of self. And it's like, okay, so there's body, there's Vedana, there's perception. And I try and contact all of those separate aspects of what I take to be a self and just experience it as khandas, just in the beginning, really. And then also maybe sometimes slipping in a, a phrase like not me, not mine, not a self, just to remember, you know, that we are um, a process, natural process. But it's, yeah, I guess also looking at what you own. But I mean, I'm talking to someone who hasn't fully re realized this. So I guess I still have to practice in some ways. Um, it doesn't matter. Okay, I'll do this one. It's only through meditation that I came to remember the traumatic events I lived through as a child. Sometimes states of emotional flashbacks and dissociation appear in meditation after. Do you have any advice how to treat experiences originating in past trauma? My heart felt thanks to both of you. And of course, the answer is yes. This is going back to a story I say very often about a, an organization over in Australia, they call themselves Assets, the Australian Society of Survivor, Torture and Trauma. And they deal with people who have been through really immense torture, who've managed to be repatriated, or not repatriated, get um, a, uh, what's it called, a migrant status over in Australia. So physically they're free, but emotionally they're still in those torture chambers in these you know, countries over in our world, which they treat human beings incredibly brutally. And so I was so surprised and happy to find that some of the people who would come to my talks were psychologists and psychiatrists and therapists, and they use this practice of opening the door of your heart for people who suffered immense trauma. And what they did, it took a while. They had to feel safe, first of all. And once they felt safe with friends, they were asked them, usually sitting on a chair and meditating. And when they started to get still and confident, they would imagine a door in the middle of their chest, above their heart. But they would open that door, double door usually, and inside their heart was a person they could feel comfortable with. And outside, and the cold, dark, or cold, miserable concrete outside kept outside of their heart 
was those little girls who were just so badly raped and beaten and mis and abused. You know, the boy who was beaten for no reason. And they're outside. And they imagine like a staircase or a ladder coming down from their heart to the ground. And they invite every one of those little girls who are so tortured up into their hearts. The door of my heart is open to you, no matter who you are. It takes immense courage, but they do it. And those people who were them in the past climb up those stairs with a lot of encouragement for the person who's already in the heart. And they embrace, I will never keep you out ever again. You know, who I am, welcome. And it's incredible to us how that heals just those bad memories of the past. You can't forget them, but trying to keep them out of your heart is what one of the big problems is. You welcome them in, have a huge hug, and you never ever push them out. And that, the wonderful thing I, is going there and seeing just the results of this. People who have just been through hell, which would have probably killed me. And they were talking in front of me to another young man, a young man, a very kind, wise young man, was saying, that was terrible what you went through. And this middle-aged woman said, what do you mean terrible? You've got no right to say that. That's what made me who I am today. And her strength and peace with what she was saying just left me awestruck. She'd gone through that, and she was never a victim anymore. She was an incredibly powerful woman. So that's actually one way of doing it. You can't push these type of solutions. You have to feel safe and ready for them. And then they come up. But if you're in meditation already, come up and welcome them in. Thank you for coming. I draw my heart open to you. Beautiful. Yeah. Okay. I think the last one now for tonight. I don't know, there might be some we've missed, but I think yeah. we'll keep it here. Good. I'm currently experiencing quite a high level of depressive emotion in my meditation due to some worldly problems. Meta helps, but it keeps coming back quite relentlessly. Can you advise on anything else I can try? So <laughs> I'm going to be influenced by Ajahn Brahm's last answer, which I found extremely beautiful and um, suggest that perhaps there's a possibility of being more welcoming to this depression because sometimes the meta can help and it can actually even change our mood to a degree but sometimes there's also an aspect of us that uses the meta to try and keep it away and to stop it coming back so you will have to have times where you're not sinking in the depression and I have uh, myself because I have suffered depression actually quite recently um, that it was really helpful one of the most helpful things sometimes was um, to be around friends and to be around good company and you know not to let myself kind of sink into that and then at other times I could be with the depression like in a really open and welcoming way that allowed me to feel it fully and sometimes to cry so sometimes we're avoiding these emotions, you know, and we're doing the meta to kind of keep it at bay. And sometimes it needs to be felt, but not all the time. So, you know, not like uh, all day long. Sometimes you just need to be with someone else and talk to someone who cares, you know. But um, I would say that, yeah, if you can practice meta from time to time as a practice and at other times practice it as an opening of the heart and giving space to whatever you feel. The other thing I would say is, depending on the level of depression and the kind of um, consistency of that, like if you find the gaps, that's wonderful, and try to notice those gaps because that can encourage you to re remember that it's impermanent. But at other times, if you find it's really getting kind of intractable, then you can go and have some counselling or even take some antidepressants for some time. There's no stigma in that. 
it can just help because if the depression stays for a long time, it can have some kind of, that can cause a chemical change. And sometimes it can be physiological. Just getting that little bit of a lift can maybe help you to practice your meditation more effectively for a while, you know, and just try and see the light at the end of the tunnel. I've never taken antidepressants myself, but I wouldn't be against doing it if I was really stuck in a rut. So, and I think it needs to be destigmatized. So I don't know if some of that might help or if Ajahn has anything else to say yeah, about sure. that. Yeah. So, yeah, just be really kind to yourself. Another thing I often try to um, remind myself when I experience any kind of afflictive emotion is that the Buddha did teach that the suffering and that suffering is to be understood. And not that that gets me stuck in it, but it helps me not to push it away because I have the trust that there'll be something to come out of it at the very least, more compassion for others that have been through similar. And I'm sure that's why, you know, I can empathize to some extent with people who have had depression because I've had it myself in my teens and probably two or three times in my life, like a period of it, which was, you know, maybe a year or two. So uh, this is going to be one of the beautiful outcomes. You know, you're going to learn tools to work with it. You're going to learn how to be with it, how to cry, how to, you know, come out of it as well eventually because it will lift and then you're going to be such a good friend to someone else so i hope that helps yeah Sadu, Sadu. Excellent. and there's another question session tomorrow <laughs> yeah. the last one for this retreat um so yes we can yeah we look forward to seeing you tomorrow we'll see what happens so have a lovely rest. Good night. And remember to do meta loving kindness to yourself, accepting yourself just yeah. ah. as you are. Thanks. Good night.